Thank you very much for joining us for the May 15th, 2019 Living Shorelines Community of Practice. We will be introducing our topic and speaker in just a moment. Uh, in the meantime, I will introduce everybody to Restore America's Estuaries for those of you who may not be familiar with us. We are a national nonprofit working around the country, and we are dedicated to the protection and restoration of bays and estuaries as essential resources for our nation. You can see our member groups there. Without them, we would not be able to do all the great work that we do. Um, and you should have received the agenda since you're on this call. And so the way this will work is we'll go through the various items on the agenda and if you have a question or comment you may either virtually raise your hand on using the controls for the webinar or you could submit a question and or a comment and I will read it on your behalf. Just as a reminder everyone is on mute uh, with the exception of our speaker uh, Dr. Lindquist so again raise your hand or submit a question. Uh, we are recording currently and these will be posted this will be posted on the Ray YouTube channel um, I am in the process of processing the older ones and posting them so please check back or ask a question so briefly I will give a national update uh, from our perspective uh, the big one right now is we are very happy to say that the North Carolina workshop is still moving forward it will be October 8th and 9th in Beaufort, North Carolina, and it will be a national gathering of the Living Shorelines community. The registration will open early summer. Right now, we're looking at early June, and the website has additional information, including travel information and a draft agenda. So we do have somebody with a hand up. So I will unmute you, Craig, Craig Wood. Did you have uh, an update, Craig? Uh, no, I, I'm all set. Sorry, it was just a uh, uh, hit the wrong button. No worries, that's fine. It's part and parcel of the joys of technology and webinars. So, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> all righty, uh, and now we will go through and if there are any regional updates that folks want to report out on, uh, we will very quickly, I'll just go through the, the regions. Um, anybody from the Northeast, which we will say New York and North? Great Lakes. Ah, we do have one. Uh, Kirsten Alexander. Go ahead, Kirsten. I unmuted you. Kirsten? Okie dokie. I guess another hiccup on the on the uh, webinar control panel, which is totally fine. Okay, uh, the Pacific Southwest, those would be our California friends and islands. Gulf Mexico. Southeast and the Mid-Atlantic. So we do have uh, some an update from Florida that was submitted in writing. Um, let's see, Florida's Living Shorelines training course for marine contractors is slated to pilot later this summer. That's fantastic news, Farah. So that's Farah Lamy with the uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Uh, that is great news. That has been um, a long time coming. So that's, that's fantastic news. Um, and, okay, I think that's all we have for questions or comments right now. I take that back. Tracy Scrabble. Hang on, Tracy. I just managed to lose you in the. All right, Tracy, go for it. You're hey, unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Hi, everybody. Uh, just a quick one, and I you may have already uh, talked about the adoption of the general permit for Living Shorelines. Is, did you present that at a previous one, Suzanne? Um, it's been discussed, but go ahead and, and give an update. Just that it was uh, in the state of North Carolina after uh, quite some time, a couple of decades, we have now a general permit, a regional general permit for living shorelines, which is primarily sills uh, and marsh plantings um, of a number of different materials at both the state and federal level. 
If anybody wants to see what those look like, they have specific requirements for the type of design, but they are uh, on the same level of review as bulkheads and revetments. So that's that's a positive step, and we are seeing uh, a sharp uptick in requ requests for these projects. That's fantastic. Congratulations. I know you've been working long and hard on, on at least attempting to get some parity, so that's great news. Anything else you want to add, Tracy? No. Thank you for what you do. Sure. Back at you. Thanks. All right. The other thing on a national update I wanted to provide is there are efforts underway to include um, soft and green approaches like living shorelines and, and their brethren, if you will, um, into the big infrastructure plans that are moving their way through Congress right now. I think that um, there there's noise about the infrastructure package moving late summer, early fall. So um, know that there are folks, uh, including Restore America's Estuaries, that are working very hard to um, make sure that, that these um, approaches are included in that. All righty. Any other questions, comments, updates? Hearing none, I am delighted to introduce our focus topic, which will be development of an ephemeral hardscape for living shoreline creation. Our speaker is Dr. Niels Lindquist, who is with the UNC Chapel Hill Institute of Marine Sciences and has for the past decade conducted research on the ecology of and restoration strategies for the Eastern oyster. Dr. Lindquist's perspective on oyster reef is informed by over 30 years of prior research focused on coral reefs, including the chemical defense of seaweeds and invertebrates and nitrogen and carbon cycling in tropical reef and lagoon systems mediated by sponges. Today's focus topic um, will be about research and innovation leading to the development of a structurally versatile biodegradable hardscape emerging as an effective tool for the creation and protection of oyster and salt marsh habitats, both along and away from estuarine shorelines. So with that, I will hand over my screen to Dr. Lindquist, and he can take it away from there. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Wonderful. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to present the um, work that we've been doing and developing this new material. And hopefully after this uh, webinar, a lot of other people will be excited about it as well. So I'll go ahead Dr. and- Dr. Lindquist? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Show your make sure you show your screen. There, you see it. There you go. Beautiful. Okay, wonderful. Well, let's go ahead and get started. So, um, as you heard, I'm at the uh, UNC Institute of Marine Sciences in Moorhead City. So, in that's North Carolina. I've done uh, most of our work here, and. Yeah, this is a, an informed audience, but I wanted to sort of uh, give a shout out to Rowan Jacobson and his recent article in Scientific American that I think has done a wonderful job in sort of framing the need for living shorelines and natural infrastructure and shoreline protection from various um, aspects. So if you haven't seen that, it would be a, a great article to, to pick up and read. And for the talk that I'm going to be giving today, I want to cover a little bit of sea level rise considerations because it's been pretty important for North Carolina over the last few years. And if you haven't seen this website through NOAA, it's a, a regional look at sea level um, trajectories over the last uh, 20 uh, plus years, um, I think it would be uh, informative to do so. So what you see on the left is the graph of the global rate of change. And those numbers to the right of that um, graph are the the rise for those different trajectories by 2100. But if you look regionally, what you'll see um, are some, some interesting patterns. And this is for the South Atlantic coast where we are in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. And this is based on satellite altimetry and um, some uh, water level monitoring stations. And you see um, a pretty benign rate of rise in our area until about 2010. And then it went up pretty precipitously, and that has um, manifested itself in some pretty um, important ways along the coast of North Carolina and I think throughout the South Atlantic. 
this is the uh, the water level station data for Beaufort right here in our area. So what's plotted is the, the mean monthly water level and starting in 1990 and running out through um, April of 2019 and mirrors what you'd seen in that regional view. Um, fairly low level of rise. 2009 was a, a bit of a, an anomalous year. We had some pretty high levels of water through the summer and fall. It dropped back down, but then about 2012, you see that we had um, began a, a pretty rapid rise. So today we are five to six inches higher mean water level than we were about five years ago. And so you can see in the images below that you know, we do have quite a bit of nuisance flooding that um, is cropping up at certain times of the year, um, some associated with storms, but a lot of it is not. So. What that looks like for some of the um, islands and some of the uh, the shorelines around here, it's um, pretty pretty interesting, pretty devastating. This is Shackleford Banks, and I have a little movie. This is a, a barrier island. Oh, let me go back. This is a barrier island outside of Beaufort, and this is a video three days after Hurricane Matthew in 2016. And you can see waves breaking into the, the maritime forest on this island. So, so that was um, a, a pretty hard event on the coastline. So we lost a, a lot of Shackleford and we've uh, seen about a mile of that island disappear over the last five, six years as um, same time the water levels are rising. So during that time, we had about 12 inches of, of extra water level, both before and after the storm for quite a long period of time. What you can see in these other images are some of the, the interior islands. So Dredge Boyle Island here at uh, Moorhead City, Sugarloaf. And then in the Rachel Carson National Estuary Research Reserve, some of the um, exposed shorelines are taking a beating from um, waves as well as the increased uh, water levels. So that's sort of what we're facing. And so I got uh, started in oyster reef research about a decade ago in this area. And so the Rachel Carson Reserve had some, some beautiful um, oysters and salt marsh uh, and still does, but a lot of it's under siege. So that's kind of where I, I have my baseline in oyster reef research. And I started working with a lot of um, other faculty here at the Institute of Marine Sciences, Joel Fodry, Tony Rodriguez, Mike Peeler, um, and others to you know, Began doing some interesting work looking at the, the rate of oyster uh, reef growth relative to sea level rise and just uh, a lot of other basic uh, ecology of oysters and how that plays into um, shoreline um, structures and growth and, and protection. So that's sort of where I've come through and in, in being informed about oysters and basically came away from that with a pretty you know, simple picture of, of the eastern oyster and its um, safe zones in estuarine environments. And, so where the, the water is salty um, down near the inlets, the intertidal, intertidal is the, the safe zone for oysters away from pests and predators. So you get very um, nice oyster reef development in the intertidal zone. Then the other um, safe place for oysters um, are those subtidal areas, uh, often where you don't have much tide, astronomical tides, but you have lower salinities and periodic freshets that flush the pest out. And Justin Ridge, I think did a nice job putting this together in a graph for oyster uh, reef fitness, um, looking at salinity versus the, the tidal inundation. And so you can see the tidal inundation here on the x-axis, the y, the salinity, and the two peaks in fitness. And this is the, the mean sea level, which is the ceiling at which um, oyster growth uh, stops in the intertidal zone around here. Now I realize this is um, a model that's most appropriate for this area, there are some areas where it won't apply as you get into some very extreme conditions in the intertidal in the Pacific uh, Northwest or um, up in the Northeast. Uh, so it's a general model that you have to adapt to your local area. So in thinking about shoreline integrity and protection strategies and living shorelines, you know, this is the area where we are, are really focused our attention. And it's not just oysters that are you know, important for um, the intertidal communities and shoreline protection. We're also looking at the, the tidal marsh plants and in our area, Spartina alterna flora is one that we are um, factoring into the work that we're doing. 
North Carolina's had some real coastal resilience challenges, um, particularly in 2018, we had Hurricane Florence in September. Um, a month later, Hurricane Michael came through and those persistent high water stands are really overtopping a lot of protective structures and causing a lot of erosion in behind some of the sills and, um, and other uh, protective structures. So this has you know, got people really thinking about protection in North Carolina and other places and thinking about the shoreline protection toolbox, which you see a collage here, of a lot of those um, ways in which people are protecting shorelines with the hard armoring, with the bulkhead seawalls, rock revetments, and now um, more low sills of, of rock, oyster reef, um, oyster shell, uh, as well as some of the, the more manufactured materials, the um, disc, uh, Atlantic reef makers, uh, reef balls, oyster castles and such. And where some of the um, seal development is going on, if you're using a material like the, the loose oyster shell, you have to be careful about the energy environment. If it's uh, too high of energy, then the shell is um, often swept away. So the shell bag technology is used to, to help contain that and go into high energy environments and also the, the mats. But we had a, another idea of thinking about using cloth and turning that into reef in a novel way. And that is um, something that I've come up with with uh, David Cessna, also known as Clamorhead. So he's a commercial fisherman who got involved with the oyster research with us in the um, about 2010 through some Sea Grant programs that uh, was designed to bring commercial fishermen into the, the research mix. So we began thinking and talking about the problems of the, the oysters and, and how we could overcome those and came up with the idea of uh, using these plant fiber cloths as a moldable scaffold that we harden with a mineral-based binder. So we took this idea to the university uh, with a, a report of invention. And after uh, some prior art searching, it was found we, there was no identifiable prior art. So the university went and filed the uh, patent applications and owns the patent rights. And Clamorhead and I co-founded Sandbar Oyster Company to license the rights to commercialize the invention. So at this point, I'm going to have to switch hats a bit, so go from my academic um, job to now talking as a, a representative of Sandbar Oyster Company uh, for the rest of this talk and, and telling you about the materials and how we're using them. So our idea was to design a substrate just to initiate, protect, and promote habitat foundation uh, species, primarily oysters and tidal marsh plants, and then striving to try to achieve more with less material. So the idea is if we're successful, nature comes in and really does a lot of the heavy lifting for us in bringing in materials and in the growth of the plants and the oysters. And why degradable? Um, so if our substrates feel to fail to fulfill their objectives, they'll fade away and not leave any negative legacy effects. And what I mean by that is, for instance, putting carbonate materials in, in some of the high um, salt environments, some of the very salinity, uh, high salinity waters, you can get some pretty substantial pest builds up, build up in that, um, that bed. So uh, if we make a mistake with our materials and we don't get the outcome, it, it will disappear. Also, some of the um, shoreline protective structures that are being uh, left behind by eroding shorelines are becoming a problem as well. So what are oyster catcher and marsh maker? It's a, a patent pending combination of these plant fiber cloths and mineral based binders. And we have patent applications filed in the US, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the European Union. And we're typically using jute, jute erosion control cloth. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute in Portland cement. So we uh, pre-cut the cloth to specific dimensions. Uh, we'll soak that in a slurry of binder to infuse the fiber bundles and then wet form, harden and, and cure the material. So we can make all sorts of uh, different shapes for different purposes. It can be rod-like, panels, discs, domes, logs, fences, pillows, pretzels, uh, a whole range of shapes. And these are designed for either single or mixed element um, structures. So we create that scaffold for the, the oyster reef and, and salt marsh community development. And the longevity and durability we can control by the, the binder type and density uh, the binder cloth ratio and, and basically the bulk of the material. So these are the two primary ingredients. Um, that's uh, jute erosion control cloth on the, the left there and then the, the Portland cement that we use. And these are some examples of the, um, the different shapes we make. Uh, some of these are good for shoreline reef building, others for more um, 
reef construction away from shorelines. And what I'll do is, is show you some examples of how we're using these, these different uh, items. And uh, Clamor Head gets pretty uh, good with the naming of the materials. You know, for instance, the Rasta down there, which you'll hear about, looks, looks like a dreadlock. And that's how we came up with the name uh, Rasta. The bone is uh, more of an upright support for uh, the Rastas and frameworks. So some important features of, say, the, the oyster catcher, it's uh, got a surface that's rugose and complex, so it promotes the survival of early stage juvenile oysters. It's lightweight, it's ease of handling and deployment, it's usable in soft sediments, and modular, so we have reef design versatility and sort of ease of preceding if you want to set oysters on it before you deploy it. For the marsh maker, we have structures that are hardened and porous that promote sediment trapping and plant marsh growth and allow the plant roots and rhizomes to, to grow through. So it's not a hard stop and we're looking at creating progressive shorelines that we can grow back out. So alone or in combination with oyster catcher, we can build some, some really nice reefs um, to create favorable habitats for oysters and salt marsh. So what I wanna do is walk you through some of our, our working sites in North Carolina and some of the deployment times uh, timelines. So this is, is where we are on the central coast of North Carolina. So Cape Lookout is here, Beaufort Moorhead City. Um, you see here Duke Marine Lab, for those of you who might know that, is right there. So these stars represent the sites where we have our materials um, out in the water, uh, growing reefs and, um, and salt marsh plants. And I think one thing you'll notice is that they're in some fairly exposed areas. So we are working in high energy environments. And that was um, in part a deliberate choice to see that we could actually um, have a, a structure that would survive some high energy. Also, um, Suzanne mentioned the upcoming Living Tech uh, Shoreline Technology Transfer Workshop and the era points to the venue where that meeting will be held. So if you come in 2019 to Beaufort you, uh, in October, you will have a chance to, to see a lot of these, these sites. What I want to do is start on what Glamour had called the lump. Basically, it's a big sandbar out here in the middle of the Newport River. So we lease this as a, a shellfish lease from the state and have started putting materials out beginning in 2015. And again, it is a high energy environment. We are subjected to strong currents, high wind waves, and we have uh, the intercoastal waterway and two channels on either side of us and in and have been hit by three hurricanes since 2016, Matthew, uh, Florence, and Michael, uh, along with many uh, severe winter storms. So what I want to do is just show you uh, some images of some of the, the structures we built. This is uh, some of the first reef we built with a Rasta framework holding up some panels. So um, that was the, the first reef structure. And that went out in July 2015, just prior to the, the big recruitment pulse in North Carolina. And you can see by August 2016, we had very uh, robust oyster growth on this structure. Some of these panels we harvested, we took off and uh, shed oysters for aquaculture. We are producing oysters for uh, the table, but then also for uh, creating these reefs and, and other structures. If you look at the left picture, you'll see that it's, it started out as a hard packed sand, but now after about a year, we have sediments in here that are building up, so we're accumulating sediment, sediments and converting that from sort of a hard sandy to um, one that has a, a higher organic content. So some very interesting changes there. And the elevation has come up um, behind a lot of these structures enough that we are now planning uh, Spartina out on the reef to help further buffer some of the, the energy out there and create some um, better environments for doing free on bottom oyster growing. Instead of having to grow in cages, we'd like to just grow free on bottom. And these are the, the condition of those reefs that have been growing vertically and well as spreading out laterally. So we are seeing some very good reef growth and survival in these high energy environments. We're also working to create these large um, beds from which we can harvest oysters for the table, but also we're selling these oysters into to various restoration projects, often as multi-generational clusters, so basically a spawning ready um, stock. So we have 1.3 acres on the lump and have also acquired five acres just adjacent to it. So we're now in the process of expanding our operation there to, to get to those types of results. Um, now I'd like to jump over into the Rachel Carson National Estuarine Research Reserve. And here we're working with Dr. Rachel Gitman and Brandon Puckett 
uh, and also the North Carolina Coastal Federation with Alexia Weaver. Uh, there's funding from NOAA and SARP and the Atlantic Coastal Fish Habitat Partnership for this reef building. So we're doing this in, in three different environments. One is in a tidal creek, and this is um, an image of one of the bone rasta reefs being built uh, in the, along the tidal creek edge. And you can see the bones are the uprights that are supporting the rastas here. In this case, we preceded the rastas. We put them out on the, the lump on the intertidal sandbar, and these bundles got really good oyster settlement and growth on those. And then we hauled those over to the Rachel Carson and created this layer with oysters already uh, attached and growing. So this is the, the evolution of those reefs. And there were four of them built in the, um, the creek. You can see the, the framework here. And that was after construction in May 2018. By June, the oysters are growing. There's still a lot of space underneath the reef. But then by August, we start to see some interesting things happening. A lot of sediment build up underneath the reef. And so by January, you can clearly see quite a bit of uh, sediment build up inside that reef framework. So this is a, a picture a little closer of the um, sediment build up between the elements of that reef. It's a very soft uh, sediment, very organic rich, and is probably uh, created a lot from the feces and pseudofeces of the oysters. There just is not enough current to sweep that out. And so this is what one of those reefs would look like now. You see quite a bit of sediment build up. And so there's the likelihood that the salt marsh will grow out and into the structure. And Rachel Gitman's lab is now planting salt marsh behind these reefs to, to see how that does, the Spartina. This is um, one of the oyster shell bag reefs that was created in the um, Tidal Creek, and you know the bags are, are holding together well, and oysters are beginning to recruit to it. Uh, it's just a, a different structure, a different reef. So we'll see how those do over time with uh, the work that Rachel and company are doing. If we jump out to the wave-exposed shore um, along Carrot Island, this is is what we're looking at, sort of a, an eroding marsh. This is the peat uh, that's exposed after the the um, growing vegetation is pushed back. So it's a fairly soft sediment. And again, here we're building uh, a reef with the bones inserted into that soft peat. Here we put logs within the reef framework to help trap sediment. And then again, seeded um, rosses on top of that. So when we walked away, it looked pretty much like that in May, 2018. So by February, this is how those reefs were, were looking. So a lot of very robust oyster growth. And I think the high energy is, is actually uh, Good for the, the oysters as well as we can hold them if we can hold them in place. I've seen a lot of sediment build up within these reefs, and if you look underneath, you go back, you see uh, a lot of uh, live oysters growing on the rosses that we brought in, but also on the bones. Very good recruitment of what we put in that had no existing oyster when we put it down. So we're seeing the reef framework fill in with oyster growth as well as sediment accumulation. So I just got a short movie that'll show you how these reefs are taking some of the wave energy on the shoreline. So they do a, a good job of, of knocking back the wave energy. The water will run through them, not um, uh, at the velocity that it does around them. So you can see quite a bit more erosion of the, the shoreline here, but behind these reefs, uh, we are really holding the sediment together and actually accumulating some finer sediments, some of the sand. And this is, a, again, a site where uh, the Gitman lab is, is planting Spartina behind these reefs to, to see how that uh, these reefs do in protecting the, um, the plants and promoting their growth. So this is what a, a control area along that shoreline looks like. This is March, August 2018, and this is where that shoreline was in August 2017. And this is where we were um, you know, going into this year after some of those severe storms, quite a bit of erosion and marsh loss. So this um, area has, I think, recently flipped from being a carbon uh, sink to a carbon source, uh, according to some of the work of Tony Rodriguez. Some of the shell bag reefs along this um, shoreline uh, have not fared so well. Three of the four were largely uh, really blown apart by Hurricane Michael. Hurricane Florence came in 
and the storm surge and all the damage really rode up and over the marsh. Michael came in with only a foot or so of water level rise and a lot of onshore winds here. So there was not sufficient time for the reefs, these shellbag reefs to have the oysters recruit and seal them together before this disturbance came through. So uh, I think we you know, were able to do much better at uh, surviving that, that high energy than these reefs, than these uh, shellbag reefs. We're also working along marshes with this eroding scarp. This is Brandon Puckett and one of um, Rachel's students, Sarah Giddings. So here we're building a structure that's logs with what we call the fence in, uh, in front of those to uh, break the wave energy, but also to trap sediments that are washed over behind it. And now we're building the uh, bone framework to, to put the rastas into. And this is how um, these were, were looking um, just a, a few months later. We are still gonna do a little more work on those, but uh, here is sort of how they perform in terms of knocking back some of that uh, wave energy. So I think the coming months will be very telling as to, to how well we're doing in preventing erosion and actually accumulating uh, uh, sediment and um, other materials for, for plants to, to grow back into. I uh, want to jump over to Moorhead City and now look at a shoreline here. And this shoreline had a project that uh, had two offshore oyster sills created. This is a loose oyster shell. And the hope was that these would form really nice barrier reefs and, and in behind along the shoreline, the marsh plants, Spartina would be planted and uh, we would have a, a wonderful um, marsh and oyster reef um, shoreline here. We have the intercoastal waterway about 100 yards offshore here, so a lot of boat wake energy. And what happened along this shoreline was that we didn't get quite uh, the oyster growth at the base of this fronting uh, row of oyster shell. So the boat wakes began washing it over, and you see that happening here about a year later. Uh, so the shells of the outer row are washing over the back row. These oysters that were growing are getting killed. And now here in this year, you can see how much further back this is, has moved. So um, it's likely to get to the, the Spartina that's growing behind it um, later this year. And that probably won't uh, help the plants too much. What I wanna draw your attention to is this little uh, spot out here. And what that is in last year, a small reef that I created here on the shelf um, bar. And it's a very small reef, about one meter by two meters. See a picture here of, again, bone seeded rastas and see how this reef is doing. And so by January, really good oyster growth, sealing the whole um, reef together and filling in the space. And again, we have lots of boat wakes um, pinging on these reefs. And the picture shows one of these wakes washing over and through the, the reef, which doesn't seem to, to really cause any problems. So now in March, 2019, this is how that reef is looking. Uh, when I first built it, there was sort of uh, an even water line along the front of it. But now what we see is at the, the same, at this uh, tide, we have preserved shell behind it and actually built some elevation behind it, whereas the um, bar on either side has gotten washed back. So if you look at this reef in profile, you see something that um, you know, is really uh, quite striking in terms of live oyster growth. Um, and what we're really looking to do here is to bring the height of the reef up to the top of the oyster growth zone in the intertidal and then look to grow the reef down. So this is a bit different from sort of conventional thinking about putting down a shell bed and growing the reef from the bottom up. So it's kind of a twist on bottom up versus top down um, in reef construction. One thing I want to note is we're beginning to, to see a lot of shell growing oysters here and, and stabilizing. So we're looking to also get some growth behind the reef. And I think that we're very quickly going to see this come in, grow into a, a pretty robust uh, reef in on this uh, moving shell bed. So this is kind of a diagram of what we look are, are looking to do where we can put multiple tiers into these reefs that really take advantage of that whole volume of that oyster growth zone. And these are some reef designs that uh, we'll be uh, acting on later this month down in Florida. So it'll be exciting to, to bring these down there. And you can see the overhead view here 
uh, small reef, relatively small numbers of uh, pieces to put it together. I want to come back to this reef that was on the, the bar out here um, in Moorhead City. And just a couple weeks ago, I decided I would go ahead and put some salt marsh, some Spartina alternaflora plugs in behind it to see how they did. It's not really a favorable um, environment for them, but it was. I thought it would be interesting to see how they did. And that was um, informed by part, in part by other reefs that we built along the shoreline here. This is one of the first ones we created back in um, 2015 after we created the reef and it was not preceded. So this growth was all just natural recruitment. We began to get a sand spit developing behind it as the oysters grew. The sediment elevation came up high enough that it was good for Spartine alternaflora, which we plugged in behind it, and then began to see plant growth um, throughout this, um, this portion of the, the reef. And so a year later, we're looking at some fairly low, uh, luxurious plant growth. And it was kind of surprising to see a large number of flowering and seed stalks show up in this patch as well. And now what uh, we see, this is, um, in 2018, an expansion of this patch, both back towards shore and towards the sides and out in front of the, the reef. So we now see the growth out here in 2019. In 2018, I came in and removed some of the elements here at the back of the reef, about half meters worth, because the plants were growing into the reef framework and getting abraded by the oysters. So I think we have an opportunity with this technology to think about just stepping shorelines out um, in a reasonable fashion. Uh, over a, you know, a practical time frame to create a, a shoreline that grows outward instead of creating a hard stop with rock or, or oyster shell bags. So a few more projects I'd like to sort of show you what we're doing. And this is one at the North Carolina Aquarium at Pine Knoll Shores. And this is a project um, that was uh, in collaboration with the North Carolina Coastal Federation and uh, funded with NOAA, uh, with some funding from NOAA. So this is 185 feet of uh, a shoreline. We were slated to do this work back in uh, 2018. We got started in, in September and then Hurricane Florence came through and that Michael and some other things caused us to put the reef building off until um, April this year. But what you can see in A, B, C is sort of this progression of the uh, building of the reef. We first came in with a, a log that we put a fence in and then staked in with bamboo. So in some environments, this may be sufficient for breaking wave energy and accumulating sediments, but in this case, we're a higher energy. We added more logs, the bones to support the rostas. These are not seeded, and then we brought in seeded um, rostas to, to tap this off. So it'll be interesting to see how this shoreline uh, is doing over time, but we expect to see quite a bit of new marsh growth back into to this area. Another place that we've done some work is further down Bogue Sound, so um, not, not far from, from Moorhead City. And this is a, a private residence where the um, Hurricane Irene in 2011 did substantial damage to this high um, sand dune bank that these homes are built on. So they came in and built a, um, a bulkhead behind the, um, the marsh. But what's happened since then is a public boat ramp was opened down the shore and the, tra the boat traffic was routed along this shoreline. So now you had a lot of boat wakes uh, that were coming on to the shoreline and, and doing a lot of damage. And now there are areas along this bulkhead where the marsh is completely gone and it's functioning as a, as a seawall. We put a few of our logs along here to see how they would do. And these were actually some of the first logs we ever put out. They were doing well, so we came in back in 2018 and just uh, added to that. And that's a, an image of some of the logs as they went in then. And this is what we're seeing now in 2019. We had had enough sediment built up behind these after a few months that we could actually put plugs of Spartina alternaflora in. But here on this section, what we had was growth from the existing bed out into the, uh, the uh, log uh, stack. You can also see oyster recruitment here, so you know we'll be interested to see how those grow, but we'll probably come back along this shoreline and add a fringing oyster reef as well. Uh, we're also working beyond North Carolina. Um, as I'd mentioned, we have a project down in Florida later this month, but we've been 
working with the Nature Conservancy and the Virginia Coast Reserve. Bo Lusk up there has been very interested in what we're doing. And we're now um, having the TNC group up in uh, Virginia making our material for a project here to help stabilize the shoreline of this island, which sits in front of Wachaprig. And this is a, an inset picture where you can see the um, erosion along that shoreline. So it's exciting to be bringing our materials to some, some other locations. And also uh, the Nature Conservancy in New Hampshire is, is interested and we'll be shipping some materials up that way pretty soon as well. I uh, just want to show you a, another reef shape. We've got quite a few different um, shapes and elements that we make, but this one I think could be interestingly used in some of the shoreline uh, protection as well. It's what we call the rotunda reef, a dome shape. So these are just some images at the top of, of some of these um, that we've made. We've made a few of them. Uh, they're lightweight. They're also stackable, which could be an advantage in um, remote setting as well as transport. Um, so it's um, uh, an interesting uh, design that sort of mimics a reef ball. And the lower panel here shows the development of this reef, which was put out in July 2018. By August, we had recruitment set on the, uh, the structure. In January 2019, really good oyster growth, and it continues to, to grow and just get uh, beefier and stronger over time. So I think these could be some, some interesting structures for both subtitle and intertidal um, shorelines. So I think I'll, I'll start moving towards wrapping it up and just to show you this table I put together with features and benefits of uh, how we see oyster catcher stacking up against some of the other uh, commonly used uh, materials for, for doing shoreline sills and um, reef development. You know, we have um, the ability to really make these open reef frameworks that seem to be really good at promoting live oyster density and allowing salt marsh to grow through it. Uh, oyster castles, reef balls uh, have some of those characteristics as well. Uh, we are small modular elements, so reef design versatility. So I think we, we do quite well there. Um, some of the other products are um, pretty good at some of that as well. Uh, among this group, we're certainly the lightweight ones. So ease of handling, transport, and resistance to sinking and soft sediment. Uh, again, biodegradable, so we have these reduced neg negative leg legacy effects. Uh, and non-carbonate materials. So when it comes to bioerroders, where our substrate is not being penetrated by, say, boring sponges or polydora, polychaetes, and um, creating problems for oysters that settle onto it. With the multiple anchoring points, we have very good positional resilience, as we've seen in the reefs that we've created so far, and a lot of these other materials do as well. Um, I think we're very um, easy for remote setting and preceding the materials if there's a desire to sort of jumpstart an oyster community or to put oysters into an environment where recruitment is, is often low or unpredictable. And again, this elevation of the reef framework from what we're seeing really seems to have an impact for enhancing the community health of the, the oysters growing on it. Um, Suzanne said, that, you know, there would be questions about pricing and we're really as a startup and sort of this new technology trying to to figure out what is the appropriate price point so that you know, the Sandbar Oyster Company is profitable and can pay uh, decent wages to the people who are working with us and still make it affordable um, to those who want to use it. So these are some of the, the price targets that we're um, sort of ex working with right now. Uh, we can, again, customize shapes, which we'd have to customize the, the cost as well. And um, these are subject to change and hopefully um, will be revised downwards so everybody benefits and we can still do well with it. So where can you uh, get these materials? Sandbar Oyster Company is the, the place for um, getting them. But right now, again, as a, a little startup company, uh, there's limited availability while we're working to scale up manufacturing and distribution. Uh, we will begin posting updates on the Sandbar website which we have not populated much with things about our, our shoreline and um, reef building technologies because we didn't have the, the bulk of results to justify it. But I think now we'll begin putting that material, those uh, results up and information about how and um, to get the product and, and how much. So I think um, I'll just end at this point with acknowledging those groups that have been instrumental in getting us moving along into the point of um, 
having a product that looks like it has some some very useful um, benefits in in shoreline protection, living shorelines, and habitat restoration. So those include um, some of the UNC um, institutes uh, like the Institute of Private Enterprise, uh, Kickstart Venture Services, Office of Technology Development, uh, Institute of Marine Sciences. NC Idea was very instrumental in providing a $50,000 startup award that really uh, came at the right time to, to help us get going. Uh, North Carolina Coastal Federation has been a wonderful partner, the Marine Biotechnology Center of Innovation, and the Division of Marine Fisheries. And at that point, I think I will uh, entertain taking questions, and I appreciate uh, everyone attending and, and listening to the webinar. Great. Thank you. That was fantastic. Um, and I do have some questions that have come in already. Um, as a reminder, for those of you who are um, on the webinar, if you do have a question and you would like to directly talk to Dr. Lindquist, please virtually raise your hand through the control panel for the webinar. Uh, the other option is to use the control panel to submit a question, and I will ask it on your behalf. So um, one of the questions that's already come in is, um, you mentioned that there will be some projects in Florida. Uh, where will those be? Do you know? Uh, the first one will be there in front of the, the FSU Coastal and Marine Laboratory in collaboration with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Okay, great. So, Thank you. Yeah, um, did, did you want to add to that? Uh, Katie Conchar is leading that, um, that project. Great. Okay. Um, so when you say that these are biodegradable um, or degradable, what is the, the, the general lifespan with the full acknowledgement that, um, you know, the bigger it is, the longer it's going to take to degrade. But let's say one of the Rastas uh, or, or one of the simpler ones, what, what is your definition and, and what's the timeline in terms of degradation? Well, for some of the early Rastas that we built, we didn't infuse the, the fiber bundles as much as we're, we're doing right now. And we've seen those Rastas degrade over about a three year period, four year period. So, you know, a lot of the, the cement has uh, chipped away or just flaked away and the exposed fibers are, are degrading. And in some of those reefs, what we see is the shell has dropped off and it's accumulating around um, the base of the reef and the structures. And even though the Rastas are degrading, things are, are pretty much staying in place. Uh, now with um, the bones, which we didn't have when we first started out, so sort of that support cradle at the end of the, the Rasta, um, I think that you know, we can have elements that can last four to five years typically, or we could probably beef them up and make them last longer. So it uh, really depends upon what the objectives of the project are and sort of the desire of the person who, you know, the, or the groups that are, are funding the projects. Interesting. Okay, great. Um, another question. Um, I realize that you're you're at the let's say the the spin up phase, for lack of a better description, or the uh, ramping up phase. Um, what is the time frame from let's say the the order to delivery? In other words, what's that lead time? Um, I mean, it could be a matter of weeks. So we are now finishing up projects that were delayed by Hurricane Florence and uh, Hurricane Michael and some other issues. So that kind of backed us up a bit this spring for getting started with new projects. But those um, sort of larger projects of 2018 are, are now sort of closed out and we are uh, you know, capable of reacting pretty quickly now to, to some orders. Um, so I think that we can probably do some turnaround in, in a matter of uh, a few weeks. The challenge is going to be to work out a, a, an acceptable um, shipping price. Um, so that's kind of what we're focused on now is, is looking at the distribution and how to, to most effectively get the product out to customers and whether that's a centralized production uh, say in North Carolina that we then ship from here or if we try to set up more regional uh, production um, operations and then sort of have shorter distances to, to move materials over. So, you know, we're still 
working through those details, but you know, hopefully we'll have um, some acceptable things in place pretty soon. Well, that makes complete sense in terms of um, how you can distribute. So how how heavy are these? Like, so it, it, it's interesting because it certainly sounds like it's it's light enough so it doesn't sink into silty substrate, and at the same time it needs to be robust enough. So can you give us an idea roughly um, let's say a, a, a was a meter by meter, I think, for Moorhead City, roughly. So, how heavy would that be prior to installation? So, all the materials for that reef. Yeah, yeah. Or give, give, just give an example. I'm just trying to figure out, like, you know, for people who are used to working with with other substrates, like what's, right. you know, what I mean. Like, how does it compare? Well, say if you were looking at a a meter um, length of reef maybe something that was um, about a meter wide as well. For the total bones and rastas, and if you were putting the logs in there, you, you might be looking at um, you know, something in the order of 100 pounds total for that meter of all those elements combined. And you know, they're, you're handling them in um, sort of smaller individual units. So they are, I think, very easily used with volunteer groups, um, individual people who with a little bit of training can be um, taught how to put them in and also to make them, which is what the TNC at the Virginia Coast Reserve is, is doing. Um, so we've, we've got an arrangement with, with them for manufacturing and, and using up there. So I, th I think we're much lighter, say, than oyster shell bags or certainly what the oyster castles would be or you know, even reef balls of sort of a smaller size that volunteers could work with. Interesting, and then um, one, uh, another question sort of on those lines. Um, it sounds like they're heavy enough to not need anchoring or have you had to anchor these? The anchoring that we have done, say for logs and the fences is just with bamboo stakes. So we can just um, pin them in with about a, a three foot long stake uh, with the the rasta and the bone um, reefs, you know, any one element, any one bone is not that strong. I mean, you could easily break the the bone just by you know, putting it over your your leg and pushing on it a little bit. But you know, when you begin combining the the multitude of those different elements together, then you get an amazingly strong reef. So you kind of you know have to look towards the the engineering in terms of how those different elements work together to sort of be much stronger than any one individual. Because we haven't really seen any place where the reefs have toppled over, where they've broken once they've been put together. So I think it's a, you know, a very interesting design. And so for the roughness of something like a bone, if you want to go into soft sediment or sandy sediments, once the, the, the hole that you make, which can either be just with an auger or even a, a small bilge pump, to, to pump out a hole when it fills back in with sediment, the roughness of that, that bone, that element, basically locks that into place vertically. So we see really good uh, vertical you know, resilience, positional resilience, just with each of those elements you know, doing their own little bit of work to, to help hold the structure up. Interesting, okay, and uh, let's see, I think just one more question. Um... So in terms of permitting, um, you know, you, you, for example, the, the slide you have up right there, that, that was on a, an aquaculture lease, correct? That's right. Right. So, so, so in terms of permitting, it, it, are there any unique constraints um, in terms of using these designs as opposed to, let's say, bag shell or anything along those lines? Or, or um, you know, because with, with permitting, there's the issue of fill and, you know, there, there's, there's lots of nuances depending on what permit you're pulling, but um, are there pros, cons, or, or have you found that the permitting authorities kind of look at these and put these in the same uh, bucket, if you will, no pun intended, as, as like an oyster bag? In North Carolina, the Division of Coastal Management has largely characterized us the same as um, shell or riprap. So that's you know, been very good for uh, making the permitting easy. And now with the new permit that's issued in North Carolina, I think that that'll open a lot of uh, opportunities for us. And some of the projects that we've uh, been involved with in North Carolina have gone through what is called the major permit route here, 
which put us under review by you know, all the appropriate, all the applicable state and federal agencies. So we've sort of been at that level of review already. And it doesn't seem that, you know, people are, are raising any particular issues with um, the structures and the material. Great. Well, thank you. I, we're, we're very uh, rapidly heading to the end of our, our time here. So um, I am going to go ahead and take back the screen um, and go ahead and wrap it up. Um, so... Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lindquist. This has been really quite fascinating, and um, I am hoping that it helps a lot of people think creative and interesting thoughts and, and get in touch with you. So you can see um, information there. There there are smiling faces. Um, if you have questions for myself or Dr. Lindquist, um, please join us for our upcoming virtual gatherings. Uh, still working out some details with June, so if anybody has any comments, suggestions, or um, otherwise, let me know. And then uh, July 17th, uh, Caitlin Lustig with The Nature Conservancy will be talking about some of the programs that are going on down in South Florida. So on that note, uh, again, thank you to Dr. Lindquist and for all of you for joining us. I hope you found it interesting, and um, please stay in touch. And as always, uh, let folks know about these. The more the merrier. Uh, just have folks email me, and I will put them on the list. On that note, thank you very much. Have a great day, and 